Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everyone. As so often, uh, the conversation on the show is about what becomes of America. Uh, earlier this week, we did a show with the distinguished journalism professor and writer, Pulitzer Prize winning author, Dale Maharidge, uh, has a new collection of essays out, American Doom Loop, Dispatches from a Troubled Nation. Uh, Maharidge is a, a good example, I think, of a journalist who uh, is very pessimistic about many aspects of America, particularly from the left. Uh, but there was one hope in my conversation with Dale. He suggested that his students at Columbia Journalism School, where he teaches, um, are all politically on the left and all want to reinvent America and maintain a degree of optimism that he finds refreshing. My guest today on the show has written a whole book about this. The Kids Are All Left, How Young Voters Will Unite America. It's by David Farris, who is a political scientist at Roosevelt University in Chicago. Uh, warning on the book, it came out a few years ago, it came out in 2020, and I think things may have changed, but David is joining us uh, from uh, Chicago. David, um, tell me your thesis in The Kids Are All Left. I'm assuming that it's very much on the Dale Maharidge model. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, you know, the basic thesis of the book um, is that since uh, since around 2000, um, young voters uh, that is like 18 to 29 year olds primarily uh, have tilted pretty sharply to the left in presidential elections and in uh, and in midterm elections. So um, that is that they vote for Democratic candidates at rates far exceeding those of their elders. Um, and I think I wrote the book it's not like that fact is unknown, right? But the reason I wrote the book was to challenge assumptions that I think are pretty pervasive, uh, that people get more conservative as they age, um, and that this is normal. Um, and so the thesis of the book is that this is actually not normal, right? Uh, that generational polarization is new. Uh, it's a really significant factor that's gonna shape our politics in the years to come. Uh, and there's no particular reason to assume that large numbers of those young sort of left-leaning voters are suddenly going to decide that they're conservatives. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, I think the Republican Party in the long run is in some trouble if they cannot make appeals to younger voters um, by kind of moderating their positions on the things that those voters tend to care about. Um, so, yeah, so that's the takeaway. David, I think in the long run, we're all in trouble. We're all, <laughs> according to Keynes, we're all dead. Uh, but more seriously, when you say, and I'm curious as to the research in the book, The Kids Are All Left, How Young Voters Will Unite or Perhaps Reunite America, what does it mean to be on the left? Or what is it about the way in which American kids are thinking that makes them, uh, that puts them on the left of American politics, in your view? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the definition of, of left and right can can shift subtly over the t over time, right? So we, we shouldn't assume that it'll mean the same thing to all generations. But I think particularly for, you know, whatever we want to call them, Gen Z, millennials, um, there's a there's like a network of issues that I think unite the majorities of these of these generations, right? One is about sort of pervasive economic insecurity. Uh, and the sense that our society is not really delivering to them the kinds of opportunities and, and choices that, that their parents had. Um, so you, you can see that in attitudes about um, healthcare, about paid leave, things like that, right? Uh, minimum wage laws. And then there's a there's a series of what you know what we classify as, as cultural or social issues. Uh, I'm not really convinced that that's the right way to refer to them, but um, but younger voters are very sharply left on things like climate change, uh, LGBTQ plus rights, um, and, uh, and religion, right? The influence of religion and politics and things like that. Um, so if you take, uh, if you take issue polling on, on any of these things, like I'd, I'd point you to the Harvard youth poll, which has been, uh, being conducted twice a year since the early two thousands. Um, you take any issue poll and it, you're likely to find not in like every single case, right. But you're likely to find, 18 to 29 year olds um, with more 
liberal or progressive attitudes uh, about specific issues than than older generations. Um, and that's a that's a trend that's been in the data for a long time. And uh, so far, the evidence that we have is that millennials uh, who have been also been voting sharply to the left since the early 2000s, since they started voting, um, are not are not really voting for Republicans in significantly larger numbers than they were in the past. Right? So um, the evidence that we have so far uh, is that this trend is likely to continue. So I refer to it in the book as like this long um, this long trend line that starts 20 years ago, right? So you have like a, a very large cohort of voters that's moving through the, you know, through the lifespan, um, uh, starting to vote in larger numbers is another pattern in American politics, right? Is, uh, the older you get, the more you vote. Um, and, uh, and it, it is, I think it's already being felt in political outcomes across the country. Um, we did a show with, uh, earlier this week also with another, progressive uh, writer, thinker, Natalie Foster. She believes that the arc of the 21st century American moral universe is bending towards justice. She comes up in some ways for similar conclusions to you in her new book, The Guarantee Inside the Fight for America's Next Economy. Uh, and like Maharaj, uh, she talks about socialism. She's not shy to talk about a new kind of socialism. Are the kids in your book, the kids are all left. Are they speaking about socialism or are they just intuitively socialist? And, and what is socialism to them? Is it anti-capitalism or is it a more of a, a, a mixed kind of economy a la Denmark or Sweden? Well, I, you know, that's hard to say, right? Because socialism doesn't really have a clear definition in the United States, right? It's, it's sort of bandied about as a, as a political term of abuse. Um, and then the folks who identify as socialists, uh, I think a lot of them do think, I, I think that what they mean is Denmark, right? Um, even though what they're we saying- We all mean Denmark, socialism. David. <laughs> we all, we all want to go and live in Denmark, wherever we are. And I'm right. sure even the Danes want to live in Denmark. I think they seem pretty happy, you know? Uh, of course, these societies are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, right? But I, I think um, by and large, um, you have more people in these younger generational cohorts who express sympathy towards socialism, who express some skepticism or antipathy towards capitalism. Um, you know, when you're talking about 18 to 21 year olds, right? It's like some of these attitudes are, are unformed or uh, not really like, not firm yet. Um, and so some of the folks in these studies are, are still getting their college degrees and things like that, still learning about these terms. But, um, but I think their policy instincts are um, what I like to call social democratic, right? Um, so this is a, a larger role for the state um, in, in guaranteeing basic security and prosperity for people. Um, it is a more economically interventionist state. It's a state that, that takes dramatic measures to address climate change. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, not everybody's like this, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, if it's like 60, 40, um, you know, that is like, 35 or 40% of young folks uh, do vote Republican and sympathize with the, with the Republican message, um, you know, that, that's still tens of millions of people uh, who, who aren't on the left, who aren't socialists. But I, I think if you dig down in the data, you see also that young Republicans are a bit more liberal leaning than, than their, uh, um, their older counterparts. Well, it may not be so much the L word. It's, it's more associated with the state. One of the interesting conversations I had with Natalie Foster was that, both Biden and Trump supporters, and we'll come after the break to the, the current breakdown between young and old voters in the 2024 election, but both young and old voters in America are breaking with the neoliberal model of the of the 80s, the 80s between the 80s and the late teens. Is there some truth to that in your analysis, whether you're on the left or the right? Are you embracing the state as opposed to the Friedmanite, Reagan, neoliberal model? Well, I think what you're seeing is that the, the Reagan model has declining appeal even among young Republicans, right? So it's not just that um, young liberals or progressives or Democrats um, are, uh, are really challenging this consensus, the challenging the sort of like free markets uh, trickle down orthodoxy. Um, it's that increasingly like elites in the Republican party also say that they don't buy into that consensus. I'm not sure that they're governing that way. 
um, but certainly the the ideological movement is toward um, uh, a revision of the like you know this the 80s 90s uh, free market free trade consensus that, that, that at one point I think had captured both parties. Um, and I think if you're a young person, um, you know, you're under the age of 40, I just feel like you've seen that consensus fail time and time again. Um, like millennials came of age and their formative experiences were um, the disastrous Iraq war, uh, the Great Recession, right? The, the botched response to that Great Recession, which I think uh, just prolonged suffering and, and um, made it very hard for people to get back to where they were in, in 2007. Um, and so, you, you, I mean, you really can't blame people for sort of like looking no, at the objective I, I, reality I'm out not there. And, yeah. Criticizing is not a question of blame. I, I'm curious. What about David on the environment? Um, this is a new issue. It didn't exist in the FDR age. It didn't exist in LBJ. Is great society. How important, in your view, in terms of this new fashion for the left amongst uh, younger people in America, is the environment? I think it's a, it's it's very important to people in an abstract sense, right? I think the the extent to which people make electoral decisions based on climate policy is, um, I think the jury is out on that one. Yeah. Um, I think the the erosion um, that President Biden and the Democrats are seeing in some of their support among young people might be evidence that like taking aggressive measures to combat climate change are not necessarily like a political elixir with this group, you know. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why why the president looks like he might do worse with with younger voters than he did in 2020 or democrats did yeah, and we'll, we'll come to that after the break actually yeah. i want to talk specifically about that but intuitively then you're suggesting that young american voters or non-voters they're not defined generationally by their concern for global warming and the environment no, I think that they are. I mean, if you if, again, if you take issue polling and uh, you, you run through the questions that are pretty standard in this kind of survey research, uh, you know, like, uh, would you do you want to take uh, measures to combat climate change, even if it means um, hurting the economy a little bit? Or like, what's more important, battling climate change or economic growth? Um, younger voters are just like much, much more likely to say that they want to see climate change tackled, even if it means even if there's economic repercussions from it. Uh, they're much more likely to say that it's an existential threat um, to, to humanity, um, much more likely to say uh, that that humans are responsible for it than older generations. So on, on every conceivable measure of public opinion about about climate change, young folks are, are much more to the left, much more interventionist um, and, and much more worried, I think, about the future of the planet than than their their older counterparts. I, I guess all I'm saying is it's not clear to me yet. Um, that like the majority of young voters are willing to act on this uh, or to make it their most important issue come election time, right? Like what it seems from the polls right now um, is that sort of more prosaic everyday problems um, are driving some of their decision-making and some of their support for the different candidates and not necessarily climate change, which is sort of like this issue that's always there. It's like super structural in a way, um, but we, you know, we can't always get away from uh, you know, what they call kitchen table issues, things like that. You're talking about the Danes. Uh, Greta Thunberg, the environmental activist, young environmental activist. She's not from Denmark, but she probably could be. Um, I wonder, you, you, you wrote the kids are all left. What are the kids all doing uh, in school, in college? Are they organizing differently? There's a lot of concern amongst perhaps elder progressives that... Um, they're all left on TikTok and on Facebook and on Instagram, but ultimately they don't really care and they're driven by social media and their personal concerns. What evidence is there that the kids of the 2020s are approaching politics aggressively or, or perhaps innovatively rather than just showing up every two or four years and voting? Well, that's a great question. Um, I, I think you know we could get back into the old debate about uh, about clicktivism versus activism, right? As they used to call it. Um, I, I think the idea that people, that younger people, are spending their time making sort of like performative gestures to supporting something or believing something, and then when push comes to shove, they don't they don't actually really care that much. Um, I think that just as in older generations, there's like a there's a smaller 
group of, uh, of more radical young people who are willing to kind of get skin in the game and, and organize protest movements. Uh, because I mean, you're seeing a lot of that in the streets right now, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the situation in Gaza. Um, and uh, I think that I think the idea that like, you're going to get like tens of millions of people to be like in a constant state of, of like alert and activism. It's, it's probably not fair to the younger generations to expect that, um, particularly given some of the other challenges that they face. Is there anything different, though, from the, the Gaza protest or the protests over Vietnam or the protests over Black Lives Matter or the pro or the protests associated with the Occupy movement after the Great Recession? I don't think so. No, <laughs> I mean, there's differences in how they're organized, right? Um, but uh, but I think the basic structure of a protest is pretty is pretty unchanged um, throughout the you know 20th and 21st centuries. So the kids are all left as they have been for the last 40 or 50 years. What about on cultural matters? You touched on that earlier, David. Um, we've you know it goes without saying intuitively that older people are more conservative on uh, gender issues, on sexual issues, on racial issues. But when it comes to an issue, for example, like gay marriage, it seems as if America has transformed itself radically over the last 50 years. Are more and more Americans of any generation more open-minded and tolerant when it comes to cultural issues in the 20s? You know, I think that what you see on culture issues is um, you see progress that, that moves the needle um, in terms of policy and in, and in terms of public opinion, and then you see a backlash. Right. Um, and that backlash like, sort of regains some of the ground that was lost. Uh, but I think that the secular trend um, is towards greater acceptance of, of things like gay marriage, uh, like trans rights uh, and, um, you know, reproductive rights, things like that. Uh, I, but again, like the younger generations are simply more left than, than everybody else is. But doesn't it even mean to be left? They just take it for granted that people can do whatever they like in their own bedrooms. Why does that right. put them on the left? Well, I mean, in, in, in American political terms, right? Like we are polarized all over all kinds of issues, right? And it's anything that has become politically salient has has like developed a left, right, Democrat, Republican dimension to it. Um, I don't think that all of the issues are like correctly placed necessarily on a, on a left, right mm -hmm. political spectrum. Um, but I think there's also a downside to what you just said, right? Which is like, um, a lot of young people have spent their entire conscious lives in a world in which gay marriage is legal. Um, they've, they spent most of their lives in a world in which, uh, in which abortion was legal and they're, they're not necessarily familiar with the long struggle that took place to, to win those rights, nor I think, are they fully appreciative of like the scale of the threat to them? Um, so, uh, like, you know, I teach, uh, the sort of the road to Obergefell in my, in my, um, introduction to American politics classes. And there's a, there's a lot of shock uh, in the room when I tell them, you know, as just nine years ago, uh, it was gay marriage was illegal in, in dozens of states. Um, and that a lot of this progress, while hard won, is also fragile. Uh, yeah, although we, as I said, I think we, we did a show with um, uh, Ishikov, who wrote the book, The Engagement, um, who, uh, Sasha Ishikov, who argues that now everyone accepts gay marriage and it was completely unacceptable a generation ago. Uh, could one have alternatively entitled your book, Kids Are All Left, Kids Are All Liberal? And is there a difference in the minds of kids or in your mind as, an, as a political scientist between kids being all left and all liberal? I, there is a difference, right? Um, but some of it has to do with just the the sort of the shifting nature of the way that we refer to the sort of like the left component of the democratic coalition, right? Like when I was, when I was this age, you know, 20 years ago, progressives were liberals, right? Um, and over time, as the terminology has shifted, the idea of a liberal or liberalism has taken on uh, like a more negative connotation among sort of some segment of this cohort. Um, if you're a liberal, right, like liberal is now kind of a shorthand in this discourse for neoliberal, right? Um, and so when when younger voters think of them, like when younger leftists think of themselves, they're thinking in terms of being progressive and not liberal. Um, it's confusing because the terms are used interchangeably in, in public discourse, uh, even like sort of publication to publication. There's different in-house style about <laughs> how to refer to people like this. Um, but, uh, but certainly, you know, not everybody 
and the younger cohorts is progressive as we would understand it, right? Like um, the, the progressive segment of American public opinion is, is fairly small, right? Probably less than 10% of the population. It's just you and I, David, and a couple of yes. other people. Come on, <laughs> Basically, sure. yeah. We are uh, speaking with David Farris, author of a really interesting book, very relevant today. It came out in 2020. The kids are all left and a take a short break. I want to remind everyone that this content, I think it's very good. Uh, David Farris is an excellent writer and analyst, and analyst, a political analyst, as brought to us by our friends at Liberties, a quarterly journal of culture and politics. It's going to run a short feature on Liberties. And then we'll be back with David to talk about whether or not the kids are all left in 2024. It seems, at least according to the polls, that he may be wrong, or at least it's a debatable issue. So we'll be back in a second. News, the noise, there is nuance, insight. Liberties, it's not just a journal of ideas. It's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens. Politics, opinion, substance. Liberties is a triumph for freedom of thought. A quarterly of urgency, of cultural exploration, of intellectual delight of immaculate prose. It's invaluable. Subscribe now or find Liberties at your favorite bookseller. And you can subscribe to Liberties at libertiesjournal.com. We're speaking with David Farris, came out with a book in 2020, The Kids Are All Left. Interesting thesis suggesting that young voters will unite America. But David, I don't know if you've been looking at the polls for the 2024 election, um, there's been a lot of pieces recently about how there's another quote unquote huge shift in the electorate. Old voters are attracted to Biden, young voters more and more to Trump. I mean, even in the best case, uh, Biden tops Trump by four points in the survey of young voters, which isn't very much. The question is not so much whether young voters like Trump, but whether they'll actually show up to vote for him. Um, you're a political scientist, so you're all too familiar with polling. Is there any truth to this in your view? You know, I, I was quite skeptical of some of these numbers when they started coming out like around last summer and, and last fall. Um, I, I don't think it's particularly plausible that you have a shift of this magnitude in between a midterm and a presidential election year. Um, but as the data keeps coming in, um, there's a, a researcher named Adam Carlson who maintains a like a database of the cross tabs on these polls. Um, and, you know, I mean, it looks like if this holds up, like, yeah, there could be a pretty significant um, generational shift where Trump will at least be more competitive with younger voters than uh, than he was in 2020 or than Republicans have been in a long time. Um, what, what I'll say about this is a few things, you know, um, one prior to the 2020 and 2022 elections, the polls showed a bigger shift um, in uh, like among black and Latino voters than, than actually happened according to exit polls and, and sort of post polling analysis. Um, so we have a couple of cases in a row where the polls predicted uh, a shift in subgroup support for the Democratic Party that didn't materialize on election day. Uh, like so in 2022, Democrats did as well with young voters and black voters as they, you know, close to as, as they've ever done. Um, and so that's the basis of my sort of skepticism that these numbers are going to hold up through election day. The other piece of it is, I think that there is a, there's a sort of a, there's an external event that has shaken up uh, young voter support for the Democrats and for Biden, um, which is the the war in, in Gaza and, and President Biden's uh, sort of, I think, largely uncritical support for Israel um, through the present day. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, my classes are not a perfect window <laughs> into how young people think, right? Because I teach at a university, right? Um, and I teach at a particularly sort of left-leaning university that has a very explicit social justice mission. So we tend to attract people, uh, we tend to attract students who are on the left already, right, um, in, in much larger numbers than they are in the general population. But that said, <laughs> there's, uh, there's almost a sense of disbelief among young people that the United States is not just backing what's happening, but like funding it and supplying it. And, and refusing to kind of treat Palestinian lives in the same way that we treat Israeli lives. Um, and, you know, without getting into the merits of the substance of this stuff, like what I can tell you is that there's a lot of anger uh, and disillusionment among young voters about how we're handling this. Um, you know, that said, some of this, some of this data was showing up prior 
to the to the Gaza conflict. Right? So it can't all be driven by that. Um, but uh, but certainly, if you believe the polling, uh, Biden's position on this issue has has cost him uh, pretty substantially with young voters. And uh, I think there's some there's some thinking out there that many of them will come around in the end uh, when faced with the choice of Biden or Trump, uh, which ultimately is given the structure of American politics, that's a binary choice. Um, but we don't know that, right? Like that's just a theory. Um, and so I, I could probably argue, even if Trump runs much better with young voters this year, um, that I would have some skepticism that that's that's like a permanent change and not something that's just driven by. But isn't this also personality driven as well, David? You talk about how young voters will unite America. Uh, Biden represents the gerontocracy of the of the Democratic Party. It's him, and I mean Pelosi isn't around anymore, although her ghost seems to still haunt Congress. Uh, Biden is so old and so inarticulate and so clueless on every front. I mean, as you say, his support for Israel over Gaza seems almost absurd, and yet he continues to talk about America being great again. Uh, Trump is in and out of court. He's a social media star. He's a reality television star. He knows how to manipulate the image and build narrative and create sequels to his own narrative. Isn't it natural that the kids would be for 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 Trump? I mean, I, I think that Biden is a uniquely bad messenger for for young voters, right? Not not just in not just in the policy, but in the rhetoric. And you know, I was finishing the manuscript for this book like as Biden was wrapping up the Democratic nomination in in 2020, in the you know early spring of 2020. And I like when you met, when you write a book that's like fundamentally a prediction. <laughs> you have to tack on a chapter at the end with a bunch of caveats, you know? Um, and, and one of the caveats that I put in the book was like, look, if it's Biden and he gets into power and Democrats fundamentally don't really change anything um, that's wrong with the United States, that like strikes young voters as wrong with the United States, um, that could really cost him uh, and could cost Democrats with this incoming cohort of 18 year olds and then the younger voters um, who had been hoping for bigger change and didn't see it and are now disillusioned. Um, and so that all kind of came to pass, right? Like, I don't think that certainly Biden has, has some achievements under his belt. Um, you know, he passed the, the most far reaching climate law um, in American history, but he called it the inflation reduction act, right? <laughs> Which was not helpful in terms of getting through to younger voters that they actually did do something about this. Um, but uh, I think the perception is it's not enough. Um, Isn't the problem, though, that Biden is so rooted in the past that his model is some sort of soft New Deal strategy? And the America of the 2020s is not the America of the 1930s or even of the 50s or 60s. And that the kind of stuff that he's doing hasn't really trickled down, hasn't made any impact to the country. So even for environmental activists, there's not a lot of evidence that all the money he's invested is actually changing anything. Right. I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I mean, what, what I would say is that it's going to take some time for some of the provisions in that law to become apparent, you know, like the transition to electric vehicles, which that law really turbocharged, could take a decade or longer, right? Um, it's not something that's going to get litigated for the 2024 election. Um, and I think that, yeah, I mean, Biden, it's like, he looks old, he sounds old, his like, his register and his repertoire is old. Um, he just doesn't speak to young people. Um, I, I do think, had it not been for Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema uh, sort of stripping so much of the substance out of Build Back Better um, and the sort of the, you know, the pandemic response, the recovery response, we would have things like um, paid leave, paid family leave, uh, like a big hike in the minimum wage. Like there were, there were a lot of things that were supposed to be part of the Biden legislative package that got stripped out at the behest of these two people. That's, uh, David, that's politics. It's the right, right. Thing. Yeah. So, and what about the argument that Trump is a bandit? He's a bad guy. He prides himself on being a bad guy. He exists outside the system. He throws bombs at the legal establishment, the political establishment, the cultural establishment. Uh, he enjoys challenging every preconceived notion. Is there any tr truth to, to that? maybe one reason why young people are actually attracted to him? I mean, you, you, I'm guessing you and I probably are not particularly attracted by much of what Trump 
does or says, but he, he may be more attractive to a younger audience. I, I think there's something to the idea that like um, somebody that really wants to shake up the status quo with some uh, irreverence or, or a lack of uh, a lack of faith to like a lot of the, the sort of the principles that guide American politics, that could have some level of appeal to people who are really frustrated with the way that the system is working, uh, with the way policies are not getting delivered to them, the way that their lives don't seem to really be changing for the better. Um, you know, somebody like Trump that's like, I'm gonna come in and blow it all up. You know, sure, that that might have some appeal with younger folks, but it, but it didn't really in 2016, right? I mean, like the Trump shtick has consistently produced like 25 or 30 point margins for Democrats in election after election after election. Um, and so what seems to be like more likely to be happening here right now is like one, the youngest voters, uh, you know, 18, 19 year olds don't like, we're not politically conscious in 2016. Right? Like they, they don't really fundamentally understand, I think the, the nature of the shift that happened because of 2016, the way that Trump was able to kind of like stack the Supreme Court and, and, and achieve all these long sought conservative goals. Um, and they, and they just, they don't like they just don't remember what it was like <laughs> to have this guy the president, you know? we've done some shows on conservative investment in young people's organizations student groups in your analysis are, are, is that beginning to uh produce fruit that investment in young conservative groups and a a activism i don't know i mean I, you know um but like six months ago i would have said definitely not right uh, some of these shifts in the polls, uh, I'm, I'm skeptical that they're driven by like 20 turning points, USA antics or whatever. Um, but certainly, you know, we're now in year 24 of, uh, of young folks voting sharply to the left. I mean, you would think at some point, right. Republicans would figure something out to appeal to this group if, if for no other reason than, than to stave off catastrophe electorally for them. Um, and, uh, so certainly I think that Republicans have a, have a higher profile with with younger voters, like they're more visible. Um, they're making an effort in terms of like organizing and presentation. It's and the energy strategy, thing. and then that always seems to be one of the the great indicators of who's going to win or not. Which which side has the most energy? What about Biden's attempt to win votes by uh, addressing uh, student loan relief? That's been back in the news over the last few weeks. He made a speech in Wisconsin. Is there any point to that if Biden begins to address issues that that really uh, affect the the bottom line for young people in America? That's an open question. Uh, you know, I, I think it's good policy, right? Um, on a fundamental level, it's not clear to me that as a group, younger voters are driven by the desire to have their debt relieved. Um, I think that there's a, a segment the of younger voters and more. I think right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that there's a, I think there's a subset of younger voters who, who care about this a lot and who will be helped by this, and maybe their minds will be changed. I'm, I'm skeptical that student debt right now is as salient an issue as like as Gaza or the cost of living or housing. Um, you know, young young people live in the same world that we do, right? And they're driven by the same concerns um, that everybody else is. Uh, they just don't vote as much, but. Um, but I think there's a, there's a number of other issues right now uh, that seem to be of greater importance even to young people um, than, than something like student debt. So if I'm, if I'm President Biden, I, you know, my strategy is probably needs to be to address the things that people are telling pollsters that they are upset about. <laughs> and yeah, um, student debt doesn't really advice, crack the list. Uh, Biden is getting lots of advice from guys like you. Finally, David, um, if, if we had an outsider at the top bill coming to America and you wanted to prove your thesis about the kids being all left or at least all progressive and radical and activist, where would you send them? What, where should people look for innovation and activism and optimism about American kids when it comes to politics in the 2020s? Well, I mean, I'd point them to my city, <laughs> to Chicago. Chicago. Where, where yeah. in Chicago? What's happening in Chicago? Well, I mean, so last year, Chicago elected a, a, a progressive mayor, like the most progressive mayor that we've ever had. Um, and that, that was part of a like sort of a decade long campaign from from younger activists, uh, people associated, associated with like the you know United Working Families Party, 
um, people who challenged a very, very long standing sort of like center left democratic consensus in the city. Um, and the the organizing energy here is is palpable the um the sense that like we're at this kind of tipping point where uh, we need to make fundamental changes to how we do things here uh, to maintain the city's vitality um and that uh you know, the, the way things work here is in a lot of ways unfair right um and so i think that there's a lot of energy and enthusiasm I think the, the the election of this mayor was was driven by by younger voters by margins with younger voters um, people who um, just, I think, fundamentally think that um, the, the, the sort of the neoliberal consensus that has governed Chicago for a very long time uh, that you can see in everything from like, uh, you know, we sold our parking meters to a, an investment consortium about 15 years ago. <laughs> I was like, so uh, to be laughing rather than crying. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah, they closed a one year budget gap um, and then deprived the city of this revenue for 75 years. But um, you know, just the sense of like things aren't working here, right? Like um, we keep electing uh, sort of conservative Democrats to leave the city and like, why don't we try something else, right? Like, why don't we try um, being governed by someone with a real progressive vision? And like, you know, it, it's a, it's a it's been up and down, right? It's been a very bumpy ride so far, but I think if you were, if you wanted to find a place where uh, you can see this generational shift in politics, manifesting itself in political outcomes and and, uh, and the energy of political organizing like this this is the place to come i think right now